was sitting in my office in late March 2010, just a bit before lunchtime, and I got this email from a man I'd not heard of before as a sort of strange British-like spelling of his, of his last name. We're looking to bring someone in to take on a chief economist role in the International Affairs Department of the Treasury, and a number of people have mentioned your name. Rather than trying to explain in an email what this may entail, I'd be happy to chat with you over the phone. Lael Brainerd, Undersecretary Designate, who I think you know, would also be happy to talk with you, signed Charles Collins, Assistant Secretary for International Finance. Now, as it turns out, there's a lot more information in this email than I then understood. So this seemed to me like an opportunity to bridge the academic policy divide. It also seemed like an opportunity to have a relatively low cost midlife crisis. <laughs> it was going to be less expensive than a sports car. It was going to be less scary than skydiving. And I would get to buy a lot of new suits. I would go to Joseph Banks, you know, buy two, get seven for free. <laughs> and it also was going to move me outside my, um, my comfort zone, which at that point in my life seemed like uh, not necessarily a bad thing to do. So I decided, you know, this looked like a good idea. And I talked with my wife, and she was very gracious and sort of allowing me to do it. And so I did it. <laughs> so. What does the Office of International Affairs do in the Treasury? The best way to think about it is international affairs and treasury engages in international financial diplomacy. The Undersecretary for International Affairs is often called the nation's top financial diplomat. One of the key issues has to do with exchange rate policy. And the Treasury tries to sort of be the public face and also the behind the scenes um, face of the United States government in all things economics and international. One of the main issues that F Treasury faces, as I mentioned, is the exchange rate policy. The exchange rate, some people call the most important single price in a country because it translates prices of foreign goods into domestic currency units. It translates the price of our goods into, domestic, into foreign currency units. It affects capital flows. And the Treasury has to come out by statute twice a year with this foreign exchange report. And this is a report that says whether or not current countries are currency manipulators. So in one of my first meetings with Lael Brainerd in her office, I sat down and I told her, you know, from a theoretical position, Lael, all countries that have fixed exchange rates manipulate their currencies. I mean, you know, we know that this isn't really something that we should think about or worry about or really focus on. And Lael just smiled. I later learned why this was such an important thing for Treasury. And it had to do with politics. And in all my years of doing research and teaching on exchange rates, I'd sort of never made the connection with this. If Treasury designates a country as a currency manipulator, that means that Congress can step in and put in place countervailing duties against that country. And at Treasury, we really hated to do that. It was akin to giving the keys to your liquor cabinet over to your irresponsible adolescence. <laughs> so we would do whatever we had to do to avoid, um, to avoid designating country as a currency manipulator because we thought it was not necessarily in the best interest of the country to do this. So I'm a naive academic. I come into Treasury. And I go to Charles Collins, the Assistant Secretary. And I say, so Charles, you know, I'm not quite sure what a chief economist does. What, what should I be doing here? And he said, well, you're smart. You'll figure it out. At that moment, I doubted both of those contentions. <laughs> and if you look at the, the flow chart, the chart for, um, for the Treasury, 
the undersecretary, that was Lael. The assistant secretary for international finance, that was Charles. There's another assistant secretary. There are these deputy assistant secretaries, energy and the environment over on the left side was filled by Gib Metcalf, my friend and colleague in the economics department. So these people sort of knew what they was, were, were doing. And they're over there on the side as chief economist. So I sort of had to figure out, well, what am I going to do? So I was very keenly aware that and sensitive to the fact that I was working with career treasury officials who knew a lot more than I did about policy and who could see me as an interloper. And in, uncharacteristically for an academic, I was sensitive to that. <laughs> and I decided, well, one of the key ideas in economics is this idea of comparative advantage. Do what you do best. And my comparative advantage was research. So what I decided to do is I would write research memos. And with my deputy assistant secretary, Carlos Arteta, who's now at the World Bank, and working with some of the deputy assistant secretaries and some wonderful research assistants, I wrote a whole series of research memos, over 50 of them, as it turns out, over the course of my 18 months there about one a week, more or less. One of my first research memos was about the value of the renminbi. In 2010, there's a lot of tension between the United States and China about China, the assertion by the United States that China was keeping its currency too weak in order to promote its exports. But that would hurt manufacturers in the United States. The way that China could do this is by buying up foreign reserves, which would create an artificial demand for dollars. But lots of countries buy foreign reserves. So how many foreign reserves is too many foreign reserves? Well, I knew of some academic research by some friends of mine that could provide a benchmark. And I figured out a way that I could use that research and then look at how is China different than what the benchmark is. And China, as it turns out, had reserve accumulation 50% above what you would expect based on this benchmark. So I wrote this up and handed it over to Lael, and she handed it up to Geithner. And I learned later that Geithner actually cited this when he met with Chinese officials um, a, a month or so after that. So one of the things I did at Treasury was to write these research reports. I also interacted with the media. And this worked in kind of a funny way. So in the, the Treasury building is very beautiful. You saw the picture of the building and the staircase. But the basement of it doesn't look so nice, and it's kind of concrete and ugly. And there in the bowels of the basement is a small office where financial journalists get to sit. And so Natalie Wyeth, the public affairs official in international affairs, would once in a while take me down into this office. And we'd enter it, and then there's like a small ship's bell, and she'd ring the ship's bell. And at that moment, I could start talking to the journalists, or rather, the journalists would start peppering me with questions. After Natalie would tell them, Dr. Klein is here to speak about the Remnimbi. And they would ask me questions, and invariably, some of them would not be about the Remnimbi. And before I could offer my learned opinion, Natalie would say, Dr. Klein is not speaking about that today. Dr. Klein is speaking about the Remnimbi. So I was kept on a very tight leash, which is probably quite a good idea. <laughs> this is Lael Brainerd, the undersecretary, an incredibly talented, uh, brilliant official. I would attend press conferences that Lael gave. And they were a master class in how you interact with the media and tell them what you want to tell them and not tell them any more than that and defer questions. And I really learned a lot by just sort of watching her and had a great appreciation for what she did. Now, remember in the email, it said, Undersecretary designate. And this was in March. Lael had been kept from being designated as undersecretary by the obstruction of Senate Republicans who sort of passed in a, in a secret way um, vetoes on her, um, on her coming up. And one of the striking things I learned in, again, sort of my naive academic way was the politics. This is a time in 2010, 2011, well, not that it's so different now, but there is such riven politics. And Lael was held up from being designated as undersecretary 
for more than a year. Remember, this is during the time of the greatest international financial crisis since the 1930s. And that was a sobering, uh, sobering thing. So after about 18 months, I returned to Fletcher. And I was really you know, sort of grateful for having had that opportunity. During my time at Treasury, there are rising tensions with China. It seemed like the European monetary system was going to splinter. Brazil had said the United States had declared currency war in the world. There, were a very, there was a very slow recovery from the Great Recession. It was a great time. <laughs> well, all right, it wasn't great, but it's really, really interesting. It's kind of like being an epidemiologist during the plague. <laughs> when I came back to Fletcher, I found that my time at Treasury had, Treasury had really enriched my experience. A lot of my research that I've done since I returned from Treasury, I can trace directly to my experiences there. Furthermore, I started teaching a new class, teaching students who had taken econometrics and economics here how to write the memos, like the ones I wrote at Treasury, how to put to use in a very practical way the tools that they learned here. And also, I have all these new suits to wear. <laughs> Thank you very much.